And so guiding us and directing us this evening is Monsignor Tom Zinkula. Whenever I'm in his presence in Archbishop's, Archbishop calls me Monsignor, but he calls him Reverend Monsignor. I'm not sure why he does that, because I've been one longer than him. But at any rate, I've known Father Tom from many vantage points. More recently, he's been pastor of Holy Spirit, and now he's the rector of the seminary for the Archdiocese, which is attached to the Archdiocesan Center. And so I see him most days in a variety of settings doing work with our young men preparing for priesthood. And I'm told that he has some very fine words on mercy, so let it be so. Nice to be with you this evening, and I um, would like to just kind of give you a sense of where I'm going to go with the, these three night, these three evenings. So um, tonight, I want to focus on the large topic of mercy. It's a big topic. I thought I kind of knew what mercy was before this year of mercy, but as you kind of read about it and research it, it's really a wonderful topic. I, I've learned a lot just kind of preparing for this mission. So I want to talk about mercy. We only have like a half an hour or so, so I can't get into too, a lot of detail, but just in a general sense, what's, what's mercy? So it's this broad, big topic. Tomorrow night, I'd like to focus on an aspect of mercy, an important aspect of mercy, which is forgiveness. Mercy is bigger than forgiveness, much bigger, but that's, when we think of mercy, that's maybe the first thing that comes to mind. If, if I'm a merciful person, then I'm going to be forgiving. So we're going to focus on forgiveness. And then the third night, uh, Tuesday night, so, you know, get narrowing, narrowing, so it's forgiveness, and then particularly the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a wonderful sacrament, and probably most priests would say it's one of the most uh, special things that they do. Uh, things, one of the things that they enjoy most is to, to um, be a confessor. And so I'll, uh, so I'll take a look at, at this sacrament that people aren't using as much these days as, as, as they used to. So first, mercy, the topic of mercy uh, in a general way. I, I was thinking about how we use that word in, in, the, in, the, in the Mass, and so I actually looked at it to see where do we use the word mercy in, in, in the Mass? And of course, it's there in prayers, uh, the prayers of the Mass, opening prayer, prayer over the gifts, prayer after communion. It's, but those change from week to week. It's there in, in lots of the readings at Mass, so it's in those kinds of things. But in terms of the, 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 the words that we use, pray at Mass week in and week out, um, you know, what, where, what does that look like? So. So the penitential rite, the very beginning of the Mass, there are the invocations, and we say, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Then there's absolution. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. So there's, it's there, and, and then the Gloria, we say, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. And we say that, um, so yeah. So then, and then Eucharistic prayer, each of them has, uh, the word mercy is in there at least once or twice in each of them, but just looking at Eucharistic prayer number two, remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them to the light of your face. Have mercy on us, we pray. And then in the communion rite, we say um, after the Eucharistic prayer, after we pray, be our Father, deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be free from sin. And then we say, in the Lamb of God, Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. We say that twice. So from the it's there throughout, it's weaved in the Mass from the beginning to the end. So it's, it's an, obviously an important part of, 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 our, um, of, of our worship. I'd like to uh, 
share a story with you. It's one of my favorite stories. It's kind of long, but, um, but it's worth hearing. Uh, it's, it's called A Parable of Grace. It could easily be entitled A Parable of Mercy, um, although that, the word grace, the word mercy, isn't in this, in this story at all. But it's, 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 it's the, you know, the word itself, but the concept is there in, in the whole thing. And it's, it's a parable by Piet Franzen. He was a Belgian Jesuit priest and theologian. So he just used his prayer to open the door to our, our conversation about, about um, mercy. Once upon a time, there lived a young girl who had been cheated in love. Born to parents who didn't want her, she grew up tolerated more than accepted, put down more than encouraged, cursed more than blessed. Not once in her young life had she ever experienced being wanted and admired simply for who she was. Every bit of love and generosity she experienced had a string attached. Soon enough, it began to show. She became rough, hard, calculating, manipulative, mean, given over to crude language, a bitter young person who bit in order not to be bitten. She ceased caring about her appearance. She also ceased caring about the consequences of her actions. She gave herself over to loveless affairs, using sex as recreation and as a way of punishing others for the world's lovelessness and for the fact that normal joys would never be hers. In the same city, there lived a young man for whom fate had drawn a different straw. Much wanted and loved, he grew up in a happy home, nurtured by his mother, blessed by his father, surrounded by siblings and friends who, appreciative of his person, teased and humored him. Soon enough, this too began to show. He grew into a young man who was grateful, generous, careful of his appearance and speech, witty, and anxious to give back to others the love that had so generously been given him. One day, by chance, he met the young woman. He saw through her shabby exterior, her coarse language, her bad, language, her bad manners, her deliberately ill-fitting ill-fitted clothing. He saw her soul, its dormant beauty. He fell in love with her. But she thought him a joke. She laughed at him, saw his approach as condescending, and threw his gentleness back in his face as an insult. But he was still smitten. He grieved her bitterness, ignored the insults as best he could, and continued to invite her into his life with an understanding and a humor that caught her off guard. She laughed, but this time not at him. She laughed like Sarah laughed at age 90 when God told her that she was still to have a baby. Am I to have normal joys in my life? Am I to have the love and tenderness that I have so often disdained? She flashed him a shy smile but it was ever so brief. Normal joy was not for her, she knew it. But bolstered by that smile, he continued to reach out to her, offering her a surprising understanding, inviting her into his life. Unexpected bursts of tenderness began to swell in her, and she began shyly to clean up her appearance, to tone down her coarseness. This made him more bold, and he pronounced his love for her. She responded in tears, her heart full of new resolutions to never do anything to not be worthy of this love. But old habits die hard, especially in times of disappointment. One day, angered by a perceived slight, she set off to be with her former friends to take up again her habit of lovelessness. He called her, but she didn't answer. She wanted to make him feel some pain. In bitterness, she threw her infidelity into his face, saw his hurt, was happy for it. A bitter satisfaction seeped through her soul as he walked away, silent, defeated. 
But her victory soon turned to defeat, and she found herself weeping, regretting that it was too late. But it wasn't. He called her the next day. She was beside herself with relief. She fell in his arms, wept. No words were necessary. He cried too and asked her to marry him. She said yes, and felt a joy that for all her life she had bitterly assumed was only for others. She knew too that she would never betray him again. She was ready for love. Their life together was not without pain, but as the years went by, their love grew and was deepened by the birth of their children. Her graciousness, graciousness grew with each passing year, as did a joy that began to etch itself into the very lines of her face. As her hair grew gray, her eyes softened. Each day she felt more grateful. Her husband often expressed his pride in her and her children alternatively, argued with her and humored her. One day looking through some old photographs, she found a picture of herself as she had once been before love entered her life. She studied for a long time a snapshot of a bitter young girl, finding it hard to believe that this was once her. She prayed in gratitude that love had found and saved her and asked God to help all those who find themselves excluded from the circle of love and happiness. We are that young woman. God is that young man. Isn't that a wonderful story? I could just leave, my, you know, and that could be my talk for today. It'd be good enough. So anyways, there's lots of spiritual um, works of mercy in, in this, in, you know, in this story on behalf of, of the young man. We are to, one of the spiritual works of mercy is to instruct the ignorant. She's ignorant of love, trust, fidelity, hope, mercy. He, he teaches her those things. We are, another spiritual work of mercy is to counsel the doubtful. She's skeptical. She doubted his love. She lacked confidence in herself. He counseled her in those areas. We are to bear wrongs patiently. He did that. She wronged him. He was patient with her. We are to forgive offenses. He obviously did that. We are to comfort the afflicted. He was present to this young woman in her pain, in her confusion, and in her suffering. So, you know, why did that young man act the way that he did? How did he learn to be merciful? Where did his mercy come from? What is going on here anyway? So, so you know, with this story in mind, let's, let's kind of break open the, um, the notion of mercy. First of all, to begin at the beginning, the young man knew a God who was mercy. In fact, he, you know, he represented that God, but, but, uh, he, but he, he knew a, a God who was mercy. And it all begins with God, of course. Pope Francis' new book is entitled, the, the Name of God is Mercy. So in other words, mercy is another name for God. There's, in John's Gospel, we say God, is, there's a line that God is love, you could easily say also that God is mercy. Not only does God reach out toward us in merciful ways, God is mercy itself. And we see passages like that in the scripture in Ephesians. It says God is rich in mercy and compassion because of his great love for us. And in 2 Corinthians, we hear that God is the father of all mercies. So, this young man knows a God, knew a God who is mercy. Secondly, he saw in Jesus the face of God's mercy. As um, Father Allen mentioned, the name of Pope Francis' document that formally announced the Jubilee of Mercy is entitled The Face of Mercy. And the first line is, Jesus Christ is the face of, God's, of, the, of, his, of, the, of the Father's mercy. And we see that sort of thing in Scripture, too. In um, John's Gospel, it says, whoever sees Jesus sees the Father. The Pope says, you know, in this document, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, by his words, his actions, and his entire person, reveals the mercy of God. So, I mean, we see 
we see uh, mercy in Jesus' very being. He's the incarnation of a merciful God, so of course, mercy is in his DNA. Compassion oozed out of him. He just couldn't help himself. We see mercy in Jesus' words. Mercy's basically at the heart of, of Jesus' message. Um, in Luke's Gospel, he says, be merciful just as your heavenly Father is merciful. He teaches us about being merciful. And finally, we see mercy in, in Jesus' actions. Compassion was an essential component of, of his, his ministry. Many scenes in the gospel, there are many scenes in the gospel in which Jesus is moved with compassion in response to suffering. And so we see him doing corporal uh, works of mercy. When Jesus is with people who are suffering from hunger, he feeds them. He just can't help himself. He just has to do it. When, when Jesus encounters people who are suffering from illness, he heals them. They just draw that out of him, that healing power. When Jesus is approached by people who are possessed by dark forces, he, um, he frees them. So God is mercy. Jesus is the face of God's mercy. And thirdly, then, we are to imitate Jesus' mercy. We are to be imitators, not admirers. And we can admire it too, but he wants more than that for us to be um, imitators of, of his mercy. So, you know, one way of looking at that, one way of putting that is that we are to look through the eyes of Jesus. Um, he's the face of God's mercy. So we look through the eyes of Jesus and see the face of Jesus in the faces of others, particularly in the least, the last, the lost, and the, and the lonely. So like the motto for this holy year is merciful like the Father. That's what we're supposed to be working on in a, in a special way this, um, this, this year. And we see that sort of thing and again in the scriptures and the Beatitudes. One of them is, as you know, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So it actually comes back around to us if we are merciful. But we don't do it just for that reason, but, it, but it, it, um, it, that's how it works. So obviously, the young man in the story was, was formed and molded in the grace, love, and mercy of God. And so consequently, he looked at others through the eyes of Jesus. He saw Jesus in the face of that young woman, and he treated her mercifully. And this eventually led to her transformation as she too gradually developed habits of mercy. And that's what it's all about, I think, is to... You know, as we live our lives trying to be the best people we can be and trying to be merciful, that we develop habits of mercy. It becomes just, you know, uh, we just respond mercifully, instinctively. We just, we just it just happens without even thinking about it. We develop these habits of mercy. I think the same sort of thing is, you know, so this young man in the story, but this, there's the same sort of thing in Pope Francis's life. He, uh, some of it's, he's talked about this a number of times, and and probably some of you have read about this or heard about it. Um, like the young man in the story, Pope Francis experienced God's, God's mercy um, when he was 17 years old in a powerful way in 1953. And because of that, he, ever after, after he, looked, he too looks through the eyes of Jesus. So, you know, so he's 17, and this young guy, Jorge Maria, um, Mario Bergoglio, um, experienced the loving presence of God in his life in a very special way. So he'd gone to confession um, in, you know, back in Argentina. And so then afterwards, he was, he was deep in prayer, and he felt his heart touched by God. That's how he puts it. My heart was touched by God, and he felt, um, he sensed, these are his words, the descent of the mercy of God, like the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. He, he experienced the descent of the mercy of God. And I would suggest that that's the secret of Pope Francis. He, I mean, he experienced personally in a very powerful way the goodness and the mercy of God. And he found this experience so powerful that it changed his entire life and led him to become a Jesuit priest. That was his touch-tone experience. And so, uh, you know, it shaped the exercise of, of his ministry as a priest, as a bishop, and now 
as, as Pope. I think that's, I mean, that's the reason why he is so focused on mercy. I mean, it's just, if you look closely, you see mercy everywhere in his preaching, in his writings, in his ministry. Um, that's the reason why mercy has been such a major theme of his pontificate. It's a reason for the year of mercy. I mean, he wanted to, he's an old man, and I'm gonna, he's going to get this mercy thing in there as quick as he can in his um, pontificate because it's such an important thing. So, so um, you know, so that's why he does things like providing food to hungry people in Rome. He had showers and, and a barber's service installed for the poor and, home, and homeless people in St. Peter's Square. He opened a hostel to provide beds for, for um, people. That's why he speaks out on behalf of immigrants and, and reaches out to them. That's why he visits prisoners and jails during his journeys. He always looks for an opportunity to do that. That's why he called for the um, abolition of the um, death penalty and urges the reform of the penal system. That's why he spends time with people who are sick and disabled. He's drawn to them. So he's, you know, riding his Pope mobile and there's somebody and he's, he's just, he reaches out to them or people bring them to him because they, they know that he wants to interact with them. So it's, it's, it's in ways like this that um, Pope Francis gives personal witness to the gospel of mercy and, and is setting an example for the whole church to see. Pope Francis says that wherever and whenever the church, as an institution and as uh, its individual members, wherever, wherever the church is present, the, mer the mercy of the Father must be evident. That's what he says. The Pope repeats numerous times that the witness of the church is credible only to the extent that she herself shows mercy and compassionate love. If people don't see that from us, the church, then we have no credibility at all. We might as well just, you know, close the shop and go home. In the joy of the gospel, his um, 2013 apostolic exhortation, he says, for if we have received the love which restores meaning to our lives, how can we fail to share that love with others? If we've experienced that, we are compelled, we can't help ourselves, you know, but want to share that with, with other people. All right, so God is, the Father is, um, is, mer is, is mercy. Jesus is the face of God's mercy. We are to be merciful, um, you know, be imitators of Jesus and, you know, try to see the face of Jesus and the faces of others. So how do we, how do, we do that exactly? That's all nice and abstract and everything. How do we get into Jesus' head and see through his eyes? How do we do that? So I, I, we need to, to learn how to, how to be contemplative, how to do, how to do contemplative seeing. Um, contemplation is, I think the best definition is a long, loving look at the real. To be able to, to, be able to see what is real, to be contemplative in that way, to pay attention. You know, so that takes silence, takes prayer, or we're not going to be able to see uh, with, um, through the eyes of Jesus. And so, you know, his parables help us with that. Um, he, he invites us in the parables to see things as he sees them, the stories of Jesus. We hear how he, he you know, interacted with folks. We can see that, and, you know, just by seeing, seeing how he himself lived his life, we can see that mercy that's there, see through his own eyes. So, for example, we heard the story, the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan in our prayer. And um, un, we all know that story very well. Unlike the priest and the Levite, the Samaritan sees what is really there. He's looking. He's looking in that ditch, and he sees what's there. He sees a person in need. And, that, and he allows his heart then to be touched. He's able to identify with the victim and, and feel compassion for the victim. Martin Luther King Jr. once offered this reflection about this parable. He said, the priest and the Levite asked, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? I mean, it's this unclean person. I shouldn't have anything to do with him. If I stopped up to help this man, what will happen to me? But the Samaritan asked, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? 
so another another story about Je- uh, uh, about Jesus. So there's this, this sinful woman who bathes Jesus' feet with her tears, wipes them with her hair, kisses them, and anoints them with oil. With maybe that with that story, Simon the Pharisee. He basically just kind of dismisses the repentant woman as a public sinner. She's a sinner. And Jesus confronts him. He says, Simon, do you see this woman? Do you see her? Look beneath the surface. Look beneath the sin. All Simon and the other other guests saw was, was a sinner, whereas Jesus saw repentance and gratitude. And he he went with that. He he zeroed in on that. There's the parable of the rich man Lazarus at the you know at at his door and um, you know the rich man doesn't even see Lazarus this poor man covered with sores lying at his door there he is right there but he doesn't even see him so we've got to learn to see as Jesus sees contemplative seeing this poem is kind of nice um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning is the author of the poem, Aurora Lay, and, and the poem is, the, is this. Earth is crammed with heaven. Earth is crammed with heaven. And every common bush a fire with God. But only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around it and pluck blackberries. <laughs> so, you know... The ability to pay attention and see separates blackberry pickers, and that's fine. Blackberries are good and, you know, whatever. So, but being able to see separates blackberry pickers from those who recognize that they are on sacred ground. Much deeper, bigger thing. So it reminds us, of course, of Moses' encounter with the burning bush in Exodus. Moses says, so there's this bush, and he says, I must turn aside to... Look at this remarkable sight. Why does the bush not burn up? Somebody else could have just, well, there's a bush burning and just kind of keep going by. But it's like, wow, something, something pretty amazing is happening here. And so then we read in, in Exodus, when God saw that Moses had, Moses had turned aside to look, he called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses. Moses answered, here I am. So it's only when Moses decides to stop and pay attention that God calls out to him, that he can hear God calling out to him. His his openness and his awareness enable God to connect with him. So we have to um, learn to open our own eyes and look and see through Jesus' eyes and see Jesus in the eyes and the faces of others before we are able to feel compassion for them and reach out to them. We have to see a need for mercy and feel, and then feel merciful before we can be merciful. Pope Francis encourages us to open our eyes and see those on the word he uses is peri- on the periphery, or you might, you know, might want to use the word on the margins or on the bubble or something. And so I might try to do that. I'm successful sometimes, but not other times. We normally, when there's a group of people, we're in a group of people, we normally go gravitate towards our friends, people that are like us and everything. But what I, what I try to do, and again, I don't always do this very well, but just to look for people that are kind of on the periphery, on the margins, not feeling like they fit in. Maybe they're, you know, they're a little different, or they're, um, there's... They're, they're having so they're, they're, you can just see that they're struggling in some way on their face and, and try to go to them. That's, I think, what you know, Pope Francis wants us to do and obviously what Jesus wants us to do. So I'd just like to conclude then with uh, just a little, little bit on the relationship between mercy and justice. Uh, that's, if, if, you, if you look into this topic, you find that kind of any, anyone who talks about this in any detail at all, they eventually get to that and they have something to say about about mercy and justice and how do those two things fit together. And so, uh, just some things that mostly come from Pope, Pope Francis. He says they're not competing values. There's it's like there's they don't have to butt head. There's there is there's not there's not conflict between them. Mercy, and you know, mercy doesn't abolish justice. They can fit together. 
So just in general, that's kind of how Pope Francis sees it. Justice is necessary, but it, by itself, it isn't enough. It's very important, but it's, it's not enough in and of itself. But he, a world without justice, a world with justice alone would be a cold, cold world. He says, mercy is an expression of love that goes beyond the demands of justice. So the question is how to balance them. How do you balance them? Jesus sought justice, but he erred on the side of mercy. And Pope Francis talks about wanting mercy to triumph. That's the ideal. That's his dream. So, you know, I think, again, another story. I'll just conclude with another story that helps to get us into this um, comparing these two things, mercy and justice, and putting them together. It's, this is uh, Les Miserables. It was, a, it was a novel by Victor Hugo, and which is made into a musical and later into a movie, as probably most, if not all of us, know. Anybody who has, who has read the book or seen the musical or the, the movie? <laughs> okay. All right, so um, it offers a wonderful contrast in two characters of mercy and justice. So I'll just kind of quickly do a little synopsis of it. So one of the main characters is Jean Valjean. He was in prison for 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his sister's starving children. Noble kind of reason for stealing bread. And when he's finally released from prison, he roams from town to town in search of work, only to have doors shut in his face. And eventually, he steals valuable silverware from a bishop who had given him a meal and, and a room for the night. So, and the police eventually catch Valjean and recognizing the bishop's initials on the silverware, accuse him of stealing and, and bring him before the bishop. The kindly bishop replies that this was not a case of theft. He explains that he had, he had given the items to Valjean. He even scolds Valjean for not taking the silver candlesticks as well, and he gives them to, them to him too. So, you know, it's, I, I find that to be a really powerful story of mercy. The bishop forgives a wrong and lifts Valjean out of poverty. Mercy changes his life. That experience, that's, that was his touchstone experience. He begins a new life with a new identity. The bishop's mercy inspires Valjean to, to show mercy to others and even to his enemies. He becomes a kind, loving, and merciful man and a force of good in the world. So he's an exemplar, the model of, of mercy. The other main character in the story is Inspector Javert. Javert pursues Valjean for, for years and years because of a parole violation. And then toward the end of his story, Valjean spares Javert's life. But Javert can't handle Valjean's mercy. His, his world is held together by rigid rules. He finds it utterly impossible to live in a moral world in which clear lines have been blurred and exceptions to rules have been made. He has a passion for justice, but it's, it's a justice without mercy. He can't accept the fact that a man, Valjean, could be redeemed and should be forgiven. He just can't, he can't go with that. He's so tor and he's so tormented that he jumps off a bridge to, to end his life. So, you know, Valjean errs on the side of mercy. Javert er errs on the side of justice, but it's a very strict justice. He focuses more on the law than on the person. He doesn't recognize that people are much better than their worst acts. So, you know, I've been suggesting that we need to, you know, it's, it, the question is, is balance, balancing justice and mercy. I think parents probably know this very well, trying to do that with your kids, whatever. And, and but some politicians don't get it. So we could, we could use, as an example, immigration. Looking at that from a justice perspective, and we do need to do that, but we can focus entirely on, you know, they broke the law, so send them back, enhance border security, build a wall, that's there in the presidential campaign. Looking at it from a, through the eyes of mercy, we're gonna be focused on things like establishing a guest worker program, 
providing a means for legalization, improving the system for re reuniting families that are separated, um, enacting comprehensive immigration reform. So, you know, that's just so an example. You know, this example of justice and mercy in this in this in this situation with m refugees and, and migrants. I, again, we need to to look through the eyes of Jesus to see their faces. We need to hear their stories. We need to get to know them. Cardinal O'Malley from Boston said a while back, before they are illegal, they are human. Women and men with families, hopes, and dreams. While immigration reform is urgent, the needs of women and children are desperate. So i just con conclude then with a quote from Romano Guardini. He was a German Catholic priest and author. He's probably one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century. He was a mentor of Cardinal Ratzinger and much admired by Pope Francis. In fact, Pope Francis studied Guardini's writings in, in Germany in the 1980s and was going, going to write a dissertation based on his works, but never kind of got that done. So here's, here's a quote from him. I'll just conclude with that. Justice is good. It is the foundation of existence. But there is something higher than justice. The bountiful widening of the heart to mercy. Justice is clear, but one step further and it becomes cold. Before one can be just, one must learn to love.